In April 2009, a New York teenager went to Myrtle Beach during the spring break. She was last seen outside the Blue Water Resort on Ocean Boulevard, after which she went missing. Not until May 2022, after 13 years, did a startling confession put an end to the mystery that had plagued the Grand Strand for a whole decade, the disappearance of Brittany Drexel. As a former person of interest in the case, Raymond Moody came forward and admitted to abducting Drexel, sexually assaulting her, and then putting an end to her life on the fateful night. 62-year-old Raymond Moody, a longtime person of interest in the homicide, entered a guilty plea while stating in court that he was a monster. Back then, and when I killed Brittany Drexel's, I was a monster. I do not have the words to describe how awful I feel. I'm deeply sorry. The judge sentenced Moody to a life term in prison for first-degree homicide as per the charges for abducting, assaulting, and strangling a 17-year-old high school soccer standout who aspired to one day become a nurse or cosmetologist. He was additionally given a concurrent 30-year sentence for kidnapping and unlawful sexual misconduct. Drexel's stepfather, Chad Drexel, who along with her mother, Dawn Plekin, conducted a relentless search for the adolescent, stated in his victim statement to the court prior to Moody's sentencing that he always had hope that she would someday be located. He choked back tears as he continued, Thirteen years later, I find out the horrible and disgusting way she was murdered. Plekin had harsher words for Moody. Plekin, who never gave up searching for her daughter, stated, I hope you suffer in prison for the rest of your worthless life. For over a decade, Drexel's parents were anxious about what had transpired with the extrovert junior at Gates Chili High School, situated in Chile, New York. On April 22, 2009, Drexel traveled to Myrtle Beach with her pals for the spring break, without informing her parents. Plekin reportedly said before, I didn't know she was going. She asked me if she could go, and I didn't give her permission. She was upset with me the day she left. I replied, I don't feel comfortable with it, and I don't know who these kids are. Plus, there aren't any adults going. Plekin added, I told her that I had a feeling like something might happen to her. In April 25, 2009, Drexel went out on her own from her hotel and went to see a friend who was staying at the Blue Water Resort on Ocean Boulevard, Myrtle Beach's busy main drag. According to authorities, she was last seen leaving the hotel at approximately 8.45 p.m., while wearing a black and white tank top, shorts, and flip-flops. She informed her boyfriend back home via text that she was on her way to the Bar Harbor, a motel located 1.5 miles down the road, where she was staying with her pals. This was the last time she was heard from. Authorities claim that the day after she went missing, her cell phone gave its last known signal close to the South Santee River between McClellanville and Georgetown. The FBI and local officials looked for her for years, hosting press conferences and pleading with the public for assistance. Eventually, her remains were discovered buried in the South Carolina woods in May of 2022. Details pertaining to Drexel's disappearance ultimately came to light when authorities apprehended Moody that month, as he guided them to the location where he buried her body. Moody was pulled up for speeding by Surfside Police the day after Drexel disappeared. However, it would take another two years for the investigators to name him as a possible person of interest in the case. When Drexel was last seen in 2009, Moody was staying at a motel in Georgetown, South Carolina, about an hour's drive from Myrtle Beach, according to investigators. Authorities allege that Drexel was abducted by Moody whilst she was strolling alone down the Myrtle Beach Strip. Assisting solicitor Scott Hickson in court, stated that because to the advancements in cell phone technology beginning in 2019, investigators were able to trace Drexel's phone, revealing that she went from strolling along the strip to riding in a car and ending up in the Georgetown County area. The case reached a turning point in April 2022 when Angel Vaze, Moody's girlfriend, consented to assist the FBI. She wore a wire and spoke with Moody regarding Drexel's ordeal. On May 5, 2022, Moody confessed to her what he had done to Drexel. Hickson stated, 
he told the investigators that while driving in Myrtle Beach, he and Vaz came across Drexel and offered her to come join them for a party. He continued that she willingly entered the vehicle, which her family opposed. He asserted that he took Vaz and Drexel to a Georgetown County campsite where they smoked marijuana. Moody claimed that he intended to have intercourse with Drexel after Vaz left. When she turned him down, he assaulted her. Worried about getting in trouble for assaulting Drexel, he strangled her, covered her body with a blanket, and hid her within the woods. Later, he went back to the campsite, took Drexel's body, and buried it someplace else. Moody was a registered sex offender who had served 21 years in jail after he was found guilty of kidnapping and raping a nine-year-old girl in 1983. For the family of Drexel, they feel mixed emotions about the guilty plea and sentencing. Chad Drexel stated, I'll never be able to walk Brittany down the aisle and neither will her blood father or Dawn. She'll never be able to see my granddaughter, her niece who is amazing, all of what is stolen from us. On a freezing winter's morning in 1983, Nancy McKeevers, then 28 years old, passed away in her Durham, Washington County, Oregon residence. There wasn't any indication of foul play, and the assumption was that she had committed suicide. The family struggled to cope with Nancy's untimely demise, whereas the case was closed since it was suspected of being a suicide. About four decades later, new evidence came to light that drastically changed the course of the case. The mystery surrounding Nancy McKeever's case was ultimately resolved in 2023. What fresh information allowed the law enforcement to unearth the truth after four decades? The Portland metro region is comprised of Washington County, Oregon's second largest populated county among the state's 36 overall counties. The breathtaking scenery along with the lush greenery that envelops Washington County, Oregon, are the major attractions that entice people to visit and establish their homes there. This region's beauty lies in its welcoming residents lovely old-fashioned houses, and the hills and mountains surrounding the stunning landscape. Having roughly 600,000 inhabitants, Washington County is the second most populous county in Oregon. With a thriving cultural community, a plethora of recreational opportunities, including hiking, nature walks, and fishing, it offers a haven for individuals seeking to escape the hustle and bustle of daily life. Unfortunately, it also conceals a dark secret, and it is in this community that a cold case initially began. Nancy McKeevers was born in Oregon in 1955. Nancy's mother, Lenore Pepper, who is 97 years old at present, was used to hearing phrases like beautiful and sweet while referring to her daughter. Regardless of how long they had known Nancy for or had only recently met her, everybody acknowledged that she was a friendly girl. Nancy was close to both of her sisters. Being the middle child, she was adored by both her older sister, Janet Eglitis, and her younger sister, Diane Grill. She often acted as a go-between for her mother and the sisters. Nancy's cheerful attitude and kind, caring demeanor made her a pleasure to be around and spend time with. Among her sisters, she had always been the most caring one and had strong maternal instincts, Therefore, after marrying Randall Randy McKeevers and having a son, she turned out to be a great mum. She cherished being a mother, and it was obvious to all. Nancy's love for her sisters and her own child allowed their childhood dreams to come true. It was the three sisters' intention to raise their kids together. Surprisingly, the firstborn of the three sisters was born 18 months apart. Although their happy and tight-knit upbringing had been planned earlier, a horrific turn of events would ultimately cause it to be left behind. It was a cold winter's morning in Oregon's picturesque Washington County. Around 10.38 a.m. on January 2, 1983, Randall McKeevers called the police. Randall was reportedly grieving over his wife's death from suicide. The Washington County Sheriff's Office deputies arrived at the 17300 block of Southwest Rivendell Drive in Durham, a residential area that wasn't initially a part of Washington County, but became after 1983. The police came across the body of Nancy McKeevers, who had been shot in the head. Nancy, 
had a fatal gunshot wound, and paramedics rushed her to the nearest hospital considering the slim chance of her survival, where, just by having a glance at her, she was almost immediately proclaimed dead. Nancy McKeever's cause of death was ruled out as a suicide. The investigating officers found and retrieved a Smith & Wesson revolver from the crime scene, Uncertainties regarding what may have actually happened to Nancy surfaced only after the police started interrogating suspects. Nancy, her 30-year-old husband Randall, and their one-year-old son were the only people present at home at the time of her alleged suicide. The crime scene raised questions for the detectives, highlighting the possibility that Randall had either seen the suicide or that it had happened in a closed space. In order to move further with the investigation, the police had to wait for the forensic reports. After the police received the reports, they discovered that the case surrounding Nancy McKeevers' death was far more complex than they had initially thought. Following the autopsy report, forensic examinations and ballistic testing were conducted, and detectives quickly came to the conclusion that there was more going on in this case than meets the eye. The medical reports were promptly reviewed by the Oregon State Police Crime Lab, which concluded that the case was unlikely to be a suicide. There were just too many things that didn't fit. If samples are taken and processed to check for fused lead, antimony, or barium particles, it is possible to find gun residue on a person's hands and clothing. The first difference was that Nancy's hands showed no trace of gunshots residue. Nevertheless, that didn't prove anything. This is owing to the fact that the residue only becomes visible six to eight hours after the shot is fired and is easily wiped away once it comes in contact with other stuff. Thus, while it was a noteworthy discovery, it wasn't enough. The second discrepancy emerged when the medical examiner declared that Nancy's wound was too wide to be a suicide. The larger the wound, the farther away the target is from the gun's muzzle. The reports also stated that Nancy had burnt remnants on her clothes, speculating that Nancy was struggling or making an effort to defend herself. Nancy was at home by herself, along with her one-year-old child and her spouse, Randall. Randall said there wasn't anyone else there, and no signs of forced entry. Evidently, the head of police found their prime suspect. Immediately upon their arrival, detectives started questioning Randall. He told them the specifics, then confessed that he and Nancy had been arguing over the revolver, and that during the chaos, he could not recall who had actually pulled the trigger. After the officers pressed and pushed him some more, Randall revised his tale, retracted his statement, and gave them a new one. He told the police that just as he was entering, Nancy pulled the trigger. By the time Randall had walked in and realized the gravity of the situation, she had already been shot. These two versions were entirely inconsistent with one another. The detectives needed to find out the truth about what really had happened, so they talked to Nancy's family, friends, and colleagues. They were all certain that Randall had something to do with her death. The police had just needed a bit more information to make some understanding of the scenario and build a strong case against Nancy's spouse. Randall was consequently brought in for another round of questioning by the police two days after the first one, but they were unable to get a confession out of him. After that, Randall's parents paid the police a visit and told them their son is ready to undergo a polygraph test to prove he was innocent. However, Randall never showed up for the scheduled appointment. By April of that year, he had completely given up cooperating with the police. Without any new information or fresh lead, the police deemed Nancy McKeevers' presumed suicide case to be cold. A week following Nancy's funeral, her family was informed that there hadn't been any developments in the case, so the family did everything they could to put this tragic incident behind them. After Nancy passed away in 1983, not only was her kid robbed of all the love she could have given, but her entire family experienced an everlasting change. They were greatly affected by the news of her passing. Nancy had such a big impact on their lives that they were never the same after her demise. She was a contented, easygoing woman who loved every facet of motherhood. 
It was unbelievable to them that Nancy shot herself in the head whilst her kid was still inside the house. She would never have done anything that would have permanently ended her relationship with her child. Lenore Pepper, Nancy's mother, was uncertain of the details behind her daughter's death. Although she had doubts about Randall, she wasn't able to open up. After Lenore Pepper had recently lost her daughter, and the authorities had formally told her that there was no evidence of foul play, she let her doubts pass. Randall took the custody for raising his one-year-old kid after being cleared of all charges. It was a delicate matter, and Lenore didn't want to exacerbate it. Despite her strong suspicions towards Randall, she opted to stay quiet in order to protect her grandson in case that her concerns proved to be unjustified. Nancy's mother was among those who considered it would have been unthinkable for her to have committed suicide, but their doubts remained unabated as long as there wasn't any answer from the investigators. Nancy's sister believed it to be a tragic mishap that was not supposed to happen. At the age of 28, she unfortunately passed away. In an instant, her life, her dreams, and her hopes, everything was gone. The Nancy McKeever's case had been closed for so long that no one expected the police to revisit it in August 2022. The police officers assigned to the Violent Crimes Unit oversaw the cold case investigations. Upon reviewing Nancy McKeever's file, it became clear to them that justice had to be served. Nancy wasn't suicidal, however no one realized that she had been viciously slain. Before moving forward, the police looked into the previously collected evidence. Detective Anel Carrick, one of the team members conducting the inquiry, stated that the case was being looked into. Because the investigator in charge of the 1983 investigation passed away already, it was impossible to establish why the police had allowed this case to remain cold for so long. It was found that the 1980s investigation procedure lacked thoroughness. The 1983 evidence was examined again by the Forensic Science Unit of the Washington County Sheriff's Office, and the findings were similar. The possibility that Nancy committed suicide was completely ruled out. Domestic abuse appears to have been a contributing factor in Nancy McKeever's death, according to the police. Investigators chose not to share with the media whatever fresh leads they were looking into due to concerns for the family's privacy. The police spoke with about 20 people, which included deputies, investigators, firefighters, and relatives who had either been there in 1983 or had some connection to the case. Forty years later, Nancy's tale remained relevant, and the enigma surrounding the case began to unravel as new details came to light. Nancy's file from the original investigation, which had been kept by the police, states that when they first started questioning Nancy's family and Randall about the case, they discovered that Randall had been plotting to take Nancy's life because she wanted to get divorced and to move on from him. Anil Sarek, one of the case investigators, voiced his dissatisfaction over the 1980s inaction despite this overwhelming proof. He remarked, I can't tell you why they did what they did. After a while, things began to make sense, and Randall became the primary suspect in the slaying of Nancy McKeever's. Randall was living in Teagard, an Oregon town ten miles south of Portland, around the time fresh information turned up. In January 2023, police arrived at his residence and interrogated him over the killing of his wife four decades ago. He claimed to the investigators that he had undergone hypnosis to help him forget about that entire day. After talking with Randall, the police decided that they had enough information by now, and, wanting for Nancy's family to have proper closure, they forwarded the case to the Washington County District Attorney's Office for evaluation. The 40 years of information Nancy's family had been fed turned out to be untrue. By now, the Nancy McIver's case had already taken enough turns that the authorities were shocked when they discovered on February 8, 2023, that Randall had committed suicide. He also left a note in which he emphatically denied having anything to do with Nancy's demise. Although the district attorney's office wasn't able to assess the case after Randall's demise, the police believed that his departure concluded it. 
With the death of their primary suspect, Nancy McKeever's case has been adequately solved. When the police reached Lenore, she was startled to find out that all of her concerns regarding her daughter's passing turned out to be true. Lenore expressed to the policeman how much she appreciated his dedication to see her daughter's case through to its completion. She wished that Nancy's father was still alive to witness their daughter's case's resolution. The news of Nancy's horrific murder stunned everyone, evoking a wide spectrum of emotions. Her family went through all the same sentiments as before, but they all believed that Randall's suicide was just as much of an admission of guilt as the case against him. His own demise provided Nancy's family with the consolation they had been waiting for for 40 years, despite his insistence that he had nothing to do with her passing. After the shock of knowing their beloved Nancy had been slain four decades before, Nancy's family is reaching out to more of her family members with the news while preparing to have a memorial service for her. However, they are still dealing with the trauma and fresh grief. The entire family applauded for the investigative team that had brought her justice. Nancy's family believed for 40 years that she died of suicide. Despite the conclusion of the investigation into Nancy McKeever's demise, deputies from the Washington County Sheriff's Office continue to look for further details so that Nancy, who was believed to have killed herself for all these years, can get justice. They are asking anyone with any new information to come forward and reach out to the authorities at 503-846-2700. For Stephanie Isaacson, the morning of June 1, 1989, seemed quite usual. After getting ready and packing her school bag, the 14-year-old headed off to her Las Vegas high school at around 6.30 a.m. As usual, she took the shortcut through a vacant sandlot, however, she never made it past. Investigators found Isaacson's body bludgeoned to death near the sandlot. According to police, she had been subjected to sexual assault and then strangled. Several attempts were made to identify the DNA recovered from Isaacson's shirt but they all yielded no results. The case was deemed unsolved for 32 years. That is, until a Texas lab volunteered to employ modern technology to resolve the cold case with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department nine months ago. With the support from an unnamed benefactor, the test had been conducted free of cost. The remaining DNA from Isaacson's case, roughly 15 human cells, was forwarded to the lab by the police in January 2021. The police department announced that it had succeeded in identifying the assailant using the technology, creating a record for the least amount of DNA utilized to solve a case. Darren Roy Marchand was named as suspect by the police, but he could not be taken into custody. That was because, in 1995, Marchand took his own life at the age of 29. Isaacson's mother, whose name was not revealed, said in a statement read publicly at a press conference by LVMPD Lt. Ray Spencer, I'm glad they found who murdered my daughter. I never believed the case would be solved. The techniques used to identify Marchand, genome sequencing and genetic genealogy, have contributed to resolving scores of cold cases over the recent years. The most well-known was the identification of the Golden State murderer in 2018, who committed 12 murders and assaulted 45 women across California between 1976 and 1986. The horrific 1972 murder of a 20-year-old woman in Washington State was solved by investigators using this technology in April 2019. Prior to being sentenced, the murderer committed suicide in November. Additionally, a guy suspected of kidnapping, assaulting, and killing two women in 1982 was arrested by Colorado authorities in March. The proceeding is ongoing. Isaacson's case goes back a long time. According to police, the 14-year-old took her regular shortcut to El Dorado High School on the morning of June 1, 1989. When Isaacson failed to return home by afternoon, her father became worried. He called the school to ask if they knew where his daughter was, to which they informed him she hadn't attended school today, as per the police report. He then dialed Isaacson's friends, who also responded that they had not seen her that day. 
Not long after, Isaacson's father reported her as missing to the law enforcement. According to the police, an intensive ground and aerial search then took place. Around 8.40 p.m. on a desert region close to Isaacson's residence, investigators found multiple of her school books and personal items, according to the police. After that, search teams started scouting the area. Finally, they found the girl's body, roughly a quarter mile off the trail she usually took whilst walking to school. During the press briefing, Spencer, the lieutenant with the LVMPD, stated that an autopsy revealed Isaacson had been sexually assaulted and had suffered severe injuries from blunt force trauma. Her cause of death was reported to be strangulation by the Clark County Coroner's Office. In the years following Isaacson's passing, authorities claimed to have discovered multiple suspects. To investigate leads, investigators traveled to Texas, Ohio, and Washington State. Utilizing technology now outdated, the department's forensic laboratory made an effort to analyze the evidence for DNA in 1998. The director of the lab, Kim Murga, stated that it was not successful. In 2007, they gave it another go, and this time, were able to extract a DNA profile from semen that was discovered on Isaacson's shirt. The team entered the DNA profile into an FBI database, but they never found a match. In November 2020, Othram, a genome sequencing lab that specializes in providing assistance to solve cold cases, contacted Murga's team and extended an offer to use their latest technology. A financial donation was already made to the lab with the express purpose of assisting in the resolution of one unsolved LVMPD case. According to Spencer, Stephanie's case was picked in particular because of the scant DNA evidence that was available. Othram spent seven months working to make use of the DNA to create a genetic profile. According to a news statement from the Houston-based organization, the Othram genealogy team used the profile to generate investigative leads that were then sent back to LVMPD. Spencer stated that Marchand has a criminal past in the Las Vegas region. At the age of 20, he was accused with the murder of 24-year-old Nanette Vanderberg in her house after he was apprehended in 1986. In the end, the case was dropped due to insufficient evidence. Nine years later, Marchand committed suicide. Since DNA testing was not available at the time of Vanderberg's death, authorities compared the DNA obtained in Isaacson's case with that from Vanderberg's. As to a news release from LVMPD, it was a match. Whether Marchand knew Isaacson remains unknown. Spencer stated that it seemed like an unplanned incident that happened as she was walking to school. Even though Isaacson's case has finally been solved by the police, her family is unsure of how to move forward because the individual responsible cannot be prosecuted. In her statement, Isaacson's mother said, It's nice to have some closure, but there is no justice for Stephanie at all. Nothing will ever be able to bring my daughter back to us. Thus, we will never truly be at peace. If you find this video compelling, show your support by giving it a thumbs up subscribing to our channel and ringing that notification bell. By doing so, you'll stay updated about the latest investigations and mysteries. Your support means the world to us as we continue to pursue the truth in the world of unsolved cases.